Hello everybody and welcome to my latest live stream on infrared photography. We have got so much material. There's still stuff coming in as we speak. I'm never going to get to it all. Uh, so much good material to talk about today for infrared photography. I've got questions that people have submitted. We've got a ton of images, images that we can critique, images that we can edit, uh, all kinds of stuff related to infrared. I'm so excited about all the, the images that people have sent. It's going to be really awesome today. So let's take care of a little housekeeping before we get started. So first of all, um, if you haven't yet, uh, please consider buying my book, uh, Color Doesn't Exist, uh, which is my tome on uh, infrared photography. Uh, this contains a ton of information, uh, 320 pages about infrared photography, everything from filters to styles to equipment, processing, T chock full of information. So please give this a look. Uh, just about everything that I've learned about infrared photography is contained in this book. So you'll find a lot of, a, a lot of great information there. Um, if you have questions about, uh, the live stream or future live streams, please check out my website. Uh, the address here at the top of the screen, which, which is 590.red slash live. Um, and that will get you information about upcoming dates for live streams and adding reminders to your calendar, submitting files, all that good stuff. And if you need any other information about, um, uh, about infrared photography, check out my blog. So the, there's a shortcut here linked to the top of the screen there at, at, uh, five dot red slash blog. That should be easy, easy, easy to remember and easy to type in. Now, most importantly for today, Today, we have a prize giveaway. We will be giving away a copy, free copy, of this book, including shipping, all free, to one lucky winner. And the way that you're going to get to participate in this drawing is to use this link that you're seeing on your screen, which is 590.red slash giveaway. And the code you're going to want to enter, this is very important, because it's going to ask you for a code, is 99. So that's the code that will, that will let me know that you've stopped by. Um, and so all of the people who have already submitted a image or a question, I've already entered them. You don't need to enter again. Uh, but if you're just stopping by, uh, then please go ahead and go to 590.red slash giveaway, enter the code 99 plus your email so that, so that I can contact you and get your contact information. And at the end, we will give away We'll have a drawing and give away a copy of the book. Um, you need not be present to win. So um, if you are not able to attend the whole time or um, if you submitted something and you're not able to be here for, for the live recording, no problem. Um, uh, need not be present to win uh, as long as I have your contact information. Um, and of course this session will be recorded as all of my live streams are and made available afterwards. If you'd like to see the recording. So hello, hello everyone. Uh, thanks for stopping by. All right. So, so much material. I need to do these more often because y'all send me so much great material. So let's dive in and get started here. Got to get my, my water handy since I'm going to be talking a lot. Okay. So the first question that I have here, uh, let me, let's, let's, uh, get situated here. Okay. The first question I have here comes from, uh, Kali. Uh, and the, the question is, I'm lucky to have a good collection of old vintage lenses. Is there a correct way to test them for hot spots? Thank you. Excellent question. All right. Let me, uh, find uh, a test that I did recently and I'll talk about it a little bit so I can show you the process that I go through for testing lenses for hotspots. Okay, let me switch over to um, a different screen here. And so now you should be seeing uh, my Lightroom window. And let me uh, bring myself up here so you can still see me. Okay, so um, uh, let's uh, take a look at this. This is a series of tests that I shot for uh, the Fujifilm GF 35 to 70. So this is a, uh, a relatively compact, um, uh, medium format lens, uh, zoom lens. I don't shoot a lot of zooms, uh, in infrared. So this was, this was an interesting one, um, but it'll be a good case study. So you could see, basically I was shooting my driveway <laughs> in this shot. And what I did is I took a series of shots. 
I started at uh, 35 millimeter, which is the, um, you know, the widest of this lens. Um, and then uh, the lowest aperture, so f4.5, take a shot. And I'm looking for, I'm looking for a surface that is, yeah, this is maybe more cluttered than I would normally do, uh, but I was trying to get a quick test done here. I want I want a surface that is flat and uniform and doesn't have color. So like a sidewalk, a driveway, if you can get out a white um, reflector or something, that's a good one too. Um, something that will give you a uniform surface so that you can see the hotspots easier. So this is f4.5 and then 5.6, and then I'll take a shot at each whole number. And as I move along, um, then you can, if there's a hot spot, typically as you get to a higher F stop, you'll be able to see it appear. Now, uh, pretty good, although maybe a little bit, this is out of focus, but a little bit in the center here forming. Okay. So now that I've taken those shots, because it's a zoom, I'm going to zoom in a little bit, um, and, and try it again. So now I've zoomed into about 43 millimeter and I'm just going to go through these shots. And if I go back out to, to my list here, you can see the grid view. Um, you can see as I get to these higher um, f-stops, we're starting to see a hot spot that's appearing in the middle of the image. Um, and so this is what you're going to be looking for uh, to test to see. Now, of course, in uh, for most of my shooting, I am never going to go above, say, on a medium format or, or even, say, a full frame, never going to go above f8 because of diffraction. Uh, so diffraction will come into play. And so having a hotspot that comes in at F22, F32, that doesn't bother me at all. I'm never going to be shooting that way. Uh, very rarely would I ever shoot at those uh, apertures. And then you can see, I guess I go down the list, um, and you can see there's a couple cases where uh, they're more pronounced. So this one starts to get more pronounced, but really this one's not too, this lens is not too bad. Um, if I look at uh, uh, zoomed all the way in at F8, Oh, there's maybe just a hair of a hot spot there, but that doesn't bother me. Um, and so this is the method that I'll use to, uh, to to do a quick test. Sometimes I'll do a more formal test with a setup and stuff. But but if, if you could find a nice clean patch of sidewalk or driveway and then shoot it with uh, a variety of apertures, then you'll be able to see if a lens has a hot spot. So that is what I would recommend uh, you do to test lenses for hot spots. Um, and for vintage lenses, you may find that um, uh, not a lot of them at all um, have uh, have hotspots. And, uh, uh, you know, so uh, I I've probably tested 15 or 20 vintage lenses and haven't found a single hotspot in any of them. So I'm not saying that you can't um, uh, get a hotspot um, in, a, in a vintage lens, but I haven't seen one yet. Okay, so let me let me clear my throat here. All right, I had a cold like two weeks ago, and I have this cough that lingers whenever I have a cold. So I'm going to try to pound the fluids today. Um, okay, so let's see here. Uh, so welcome everybody who's come. Uh, Mark, Wayne, Terry, uh, Anshul, uh, Gretchen, Keith, thanks everybody for stopping by. Some of you have submitted questions, and we'll, we'll certainly get to those. Uh, let's see here. Um... Uh, uh, let me, look, I'll, I'll take a quick stab at some questions in the comments. Mark says, um, I've never taken an infrared picture before. Uh, I'm waiting for a 720 nanometer Hoya filter. Can I uh, process a picture that will look like it was taken with an 850? Yes, you can. An 800 and a 720 nanometer filter will have a little bit of color light saturation. Uh, a 850 will have no color or it'll look purple depending on your white balance but but typically you'd process it as monochrome uh, the big difference is going to be uh, the darkness of things like the sky and water and so if you just really increase the contrast of those areas and really bring down uh, the darkness there's a monochrome video processing video that I that I uh, put out uh, last week that really kind of showcases that, especially in the sky. So you can make a 720 nanometer image look like a 830, 850 nanometer image, but you really have to darken down the sky uh, and water to and, and increase the contrast to be able to do that. That's what I would do. Uh, let's see. And uh, Mark's watching from New Zealand uh, at where it is currently 4 a.m. Um, so I, I've been switching the, the live stream times, uh, trying to do 
one on a weekday, which is good for me, but not great for other people uh, in other outside the U.S. Uh, and then try to do them on Saturday, which is good for for other people around the world. But it's so hard to catch all the time zones; really challenging. So I appreciate you uh, leaving your questions and tuning into the recording afterwards. Uh, Wayne Wayne had submitted this question, but he he's thrown it in the chat anyway, so I'll, I'll capture it now. Which is, do you know a good lens, a Sony lens for infrared? I I don't, and and that's only because I'm not a Sony shooter. There's just so many lenses out there and so many brands. There's a link on my website. If you go to if you go to my website and then there's a lenses link at the top, um, and that will list you to a bunch of resources that I've found. Uh, there's databases from um, LifePixel, Kalari Vision, uh, and others that will that will help you to find those. Um, and if if anybody knows of any other sources, let me know and I'll add them to that list because I'm trying to you know I can't capture all that knowledge, but I want to share what I've learned or, or other resources that are available. Um, so let's see. And then Keith says, can you recommend a good ultra wide lens for the Fuji X-T2 uh, full spectrum converted camera? I haven't tried this myself yet because I know that um, the, uh, I know that most of the wide angle lenses from both from Fuji and some of the other ones that I've tried, like I've got a, a Rokinon, um, uh, lens that is that is wide that are not good for infrared. Um, I've heard really good things about um, a um, a Zeiss lens, uh, but I have not tried it yet. Um, so I think there was a, like a Zeiss twelve millimeter. Uh, there, check my, the 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 um, uh, the web page. Um, I think that there's a list. Uh, somebody somebody sent me in uh, a link. I'm gonna I'm gonna go check myself here uh, quickly, and because I, I seem to remember somebody sending me a um a link or a, or a recommendation uh for a wide angle and it was let's see wide primes yes it was the um uh the zeiss uh tweet i don't know how to, how to pronounce that one um 12 millimeter f 2.8 uh and the comment was is that it's better than the fuji 14 millimeter and and it's good at f8 and lower so that sounds like that would be ideal i know that it's challenging to find um, good, um, uh, good wide angle lens for Fuji. So I would give that a try. Okay. Let's see here. So that catches me up on the comments. So let, let us, uh, move on, um, to an edit. Yes. Uh, so let's see. Hello, Kathleen. Welcome. Uh, glad you're here. Um, okay. So I have got, um, uh, let's see. Uh, so this this first image that I've got this is this is this is awesome. So uh, let me find it here so I can pull it up and talk about it while I'm reading, uh, so that y'all can see what I'm talking about. All right. So okay, here we go. And let me uh, switch over to that. All right. Oops. We'll go down. In, we'll go down in that corner. Um, okay. So this is um, uh, from Frantisek. And he says, hello, Rob, I submitted the emulated Aerochrome last time. Uh, that was a great, very interesting images. Uh, I also asked if uh, I should submit something that's more out there again. Uh, I decided to submit the following image. It shows infrared fluorescence of a lemon half. Uh, to put it simply, I pointed my UV torch at the fruit while had a 720 nanometer filter on. I got this. I thought it was really cool, so I decided to share. Um, yes, absolutely really cool. But even more cool is that, uh, he shared, uh, a raw so that we can recreate this ourselves. And so let's, let's, let's do that. Um, so let me see here. I think it is, there we go. One over. So let us take a look at the process of, of turn transforming this image. So you can see, uh, here that it is, uh, you know, somewhat flat and, and you can see the potential that kind of comes out of an image like this. Uh, so let's take a look. So if we go to the basic panel and I'm going to pull up one of my, uh, temperature, uh, profiles from the inf infrared profile pack, <clears throat> excuse me. And I am going to, let's try to white balance. It's, it's probably white balance good already. Uh, you can play around with white balances near the the edge here, and that looks pretty good. Um, and this is the color palette that was used, like swapping. I don't think swapping makes a lot of sense. 
uh, for an image like this, you're going to end up with these sort of, I mean, you might, you're going to get a blue fruit. That's going to be very alien if you wanted to do that. Uh, but let's just keep it the colors we have. So first off, let's throw in um, some layers. Uh, some, I'm sorry, layers, masks. Uh, so let's do a subject and see what Lightroom does when we do a select subject. What kind of a uh, uh, thing do we get there? All right. Okay, here we go. Oh, so there you go. Perfect. As, as kind of expected for a nice, clean subject like this. Um, and so let's do some playing around. Let me kick up, uh, let me put in a little bit of a tone curve to add some contrast. You know, let's just go crazy with saturation and kind of just really increase the saturation. That's really cool. Um, a little bit of texture, not too much. Could go negative, but that's kind of a blurry thing. Uh, kick up the, ooh, the clarity is really interesting. You know what? I might also just pump up the exposure slightly. Maybe go about a third of a stop. Kick up the contrast. So yeah, you can see this is this this image sort of edits itself. It's a very well shot and well lit image, uh, that and, and those tend to you know just look great out out of the box. Uh, let me work on the background. So if I hit duplicate and invert mask, we'll get a mask of just the background, and now you can play around with this separately from the main subject. Uh, let me turn the overlay off. The background doesn't really doesn't need a lot of work. Um, it didn't need, we don't maybe want as much saturation. You could always darken the background if you wanted to with exposure or tone curve. So, uh, really, really fun image here. So, um, really, really interesting. And this shows like the, uh, another bit of variety that you can get from infrared. Uh, you know, I know we, we all love shooting our landscapes. I love shooting my landscapes. Uh, but it's great to see some of the different uses that you can get for uh, infrared. So thank you so much, uh, Frantisek, for, for sharing this image. I really appreciate it. Um, awesome. Very, very nice image. All righty. Let's see here. So let me uh, move on. Uh, let me catch up with uh, the chat and see uh, what is going on here. Uh, see who's joined. Uh, let's see. John, welcome. Thanks for all the submissions you've made. Um, let's see. Uh, Terry joining from uh, Australia. Wow. 2, 2 a.m. Wow. That's that's some dedication. I, I, I appreciate that. Uh, let's see. Pat Pat says, hi, Rob. Have you tried a 25A red filter with full spectrum? I think I've picked one up. Um, in, it's in my box of filters, but I don't think I've tested it yet. I've got a, I've got about a half dozen filters I need to test, uh, to see what the results are. So that's one of the ones on my list. Um, uh, it's, it's been a crazy summer and I haven't gotten to all the, all the, uh, filter experimentation that I've wanted to. Um, let's see. Peter says, greetings from Scotland. Just got home trying out the Hoya R1 Pro red on a full spectrum. Nice. Um, and Steve from the UK, are there any pitfalls to stacking IR images for landscapes? Um, so I have done, um, I've done some, you know, HDR merging of bracketed images. I, I, I had, I'd tried that a lot. Um, and I've kind of fallen out of favor with it. Um, the, I've generally found that the um the benefits that i get in in the tonal range don't are not worth the challenges that i get in in other weird weirdness that happens in the images and and lately with modern cameras and with lightroom and other related tools you have the, this ability to bring up the shadows and and do other manipulations and masking um and so what i've done is i i've done a few examples of for myself of hdr versus um, just manipulating a single image. And in, in most cases, manipulating the single image just produced a better result. Uh, so I've really gotten away from trying to do HDR. Now, the other thing you could do with, um, uh, with, uh, image stacking would be for focus stacking. And this is something that, um, 
could have a lot more relevance in infrared. And the reason is, is that because diffraction at higher f-stops has a greater impact than uh, invisible light, it, it kind of forces you to go a stop or two down for what you normally would. And if you're trying to do a, a landscape that has a great deal of depth in it, um, you might not be able to get all the depth you want, especially particularly if you're shooting like maybe a wide angle lens and trying to capture something at your feet and also capture something at infinity. Um, you may have difficulty in getting that full range of focus. And so using um, focus stacking um, could be a good way to do that. And so that's something that could work well at infrared. Um, and, and I'm sure there's edge cases where like maybe you could stack two images for to deal with um, exposure challenges but I'm just kind of getting away from the whole HDR thing I've just been totally sort of disenchanted with it um, and I've tried to avoid that um, how do, uh, let's see Jay Wilkins uh, math says how does ISO affect infrared images well I mean the same way as other images but what what tends to happen is that because in most of the time you're shooting outdoors in broad daylight, you can just use the lowest ISO. Uh, and so you don't have to worry about that. And the cases where I'll use a higher ISO um, would be um, if it's uh, stormy, dark, you know, uh, near the end of the day, more like twilight uh, or, uh, or gold, <laughs> golden hour, um, then I might use a higher ISO. But for the most part, I shoot probably more than 90% of my infrared images are going to be at the at the lowest or the base ISO. Now, if you're doing, you know, a shot like uh, the lemon, um, if you're doing other studio work, or if you're doing portraits, uh, or anything indoor with studio lights, you might have to um, may have a compromise and use a higher ISO. But in general, I tend, uh, th that tends not to be the case. Uh, but otherwise, but the effect of a higher ISO is going to be the same as everybody else. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Susan's been playing with UVIR, the, um, uh, the, uh, you know, uh, there's the, that, uh, uh, irradiated, uh, UV that's really cool. And that's awesome. And we've got some, um, another image that, uh, Susan did that's really nice that I want to show a little bit later. Uh, let's see. Um, uh, let's see. Mero says, hello, Rob, I appreciate your Irish streams. Do you shoot, uh, reflected UV? I have not reflected is that the um if you're thinking of the the fluorescent the fluorescent uv or is reflected uv something different than that um i haven't i have not done that i've 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 done a limited amount of uv i, I definitely want to do more it's it's kind of finding the right subject uh for that uh let's see okay so let me move on and uh look at let's look let's edit some more images so wayne um, had sent in some images um, and had some some questions. Let's cover the questions first that Wayne sent in, um, and then we'll look at his images. So first of all, <coughs> oh boy, I should have brought some cough drops. <laughs> all right. So uh, let's see here. Um, uh, so let's look at the questions first. So um, uh, uh, from Wayne, Rob, enjoy your videos about infrared. My question, is there a main aperture for infrared F8? Um, I have two uh, converted Sony cameras, uh, 730 and, and an 850, with the Konica uh, Hexanon 21mm and a Yoshika 135mm. Great choice of, of lenses. Those are great lenses for infrared. Um, so the question for um, apertures really comes down to diffraction. And if you want the long version of this, then I have a, a full video on diffraction. It's also covered in the book. Uh, but the short version is, is that diffraction will kick in at lower f-stops compared to visible light. And so for, if you, if you know the, the f-stop where diffraction kicks in for your camera, if you shoot invisible light, if you shoot infrared, it's gonna kick in at a lower um, f-stop. So for example, if you shoot, uh, let's say, a full-frame camera and you know you can get uh, the widest depth of field at f11 without getting any diffraction that you might get at, say, f16, then you're going to shoot all your landscapes at f11 in visible light. But if with that same camera, 
if you shoot infrared, you might have to use F8 if you're shooting, say, a 590 or a 720 nanometer filter, or if you're shooting an 800 plus nanometer filter, you might have to shoot F5.6 to avoid diffraction. So that's the, the general knowledge to be aware of. So for me, my what I tend to do is for my crop sensor cameras, I shoot 5.6 pretty much across the board for most filters, except for when I shoot a um, an 800, uh, 30, 850 nanometer filter, I'll shoot F4. So to, to avoid diffraction, uh, with my, um, medium format camera, and this is probably similar to full frame. You can, uh, I would limit to F8 for, uh, uh 590 nanometer, uh, 720 nanometer, and then F5.6 for, uh, monochrome infrared, uh, 750, 800 and plus. So those are those, that's the rough guidelines, but watch the video on diffraction or check out the details in the book. Uh, all the details, all the math. I know. Cause I know you just, you're, you're thinking to yourself, Rob, can, can we have more math involved in photography? No, nobody's thinking that only I'm thinking that. Um, but the, the, the details are provable <laughs> if, if you, if you're interested. Um, all right, let's see. Another question from Wayne was let's see here uh wondering what your favorite ir lens is and would you when well, we talked about the sony one um i found that the zeiss uh distagon t 25 millimeter f 2.8 zf is great for infrared would it work well adapting to a sony so my favorite lens probably my most used lens and therefore my favorite is probably going to be this um uh this uh, fuji film 23 millimeter f2 and i love it for a variety of reasons first of all it's super tiny um, and super lightweight and i love that uh, it has a small um, filter thread so that if i want to put filters on it then um, you know i don't need to buy huge filters i can use small filters but i i tend to use this on my 590 nanometer converted uh, Fujifilm X-T20, so the whole combination is lightweight and I don't need any filters. Um, so this this uh, lens is is excellent, and it is absolutely hotspot free at all apertures, um, so I love it. Um, it's fast, it's lightweight, it's great. Now, as I've moved to um, medium format, my favorite lens has ironically become, <laughs> probably not ironically, basically the exact same lens, but in medium format, which is this is the 45 millimeter um, uh, f2.8. And if you, let's see here. So this is a, take this up. So as you can see, much chunkier, um, as, as my kids would say, uh, much bigger lens um, that we have. And if we compare that to this one, you can see there's a dramatic size uh, differential there as well. Um, but ironically, Optically speaking, they're kind of the same lens. Um, if you take, if you do the, the crop math and convert a 23 millimeter F2 to medium format, you're going to end up with a 45 millimeter F2.8. And so optically, they're very similar. Um, and this lens in particular, I haven't shot with this one as much, but this, um, this uh, 45 millimeter uh, GFX lens. This has got to be the sharpest lens I have ever shot with. It is just, it's, it's rock solid, absolutely rock solid. It's fantastic. So I love it. I, I shoot a lot with it. Um, so these are my, these are kind of my go-to lenses. Um, I, I'm always looking for wider lenses, but these are my go-to fallbacks. The other lens you mentioned was the Zeiss um, ZF lens. And this is a, a sneak peek of the future is I have acquired, I have acquired one of these, the Zeiss, um, uh, 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 let's see, the, the, the Dis, Distagon uh, ZF lenses. Um, and these, this is a very limited run, discontinued lens. They don't make these anymore. Um, and I've picked one of these up uh, at a pretty penny. Um, and I have, it's, it's next up on my list of, uh, sort of vintage lens to shoot with. So I am super excited about uh, snagging this uh, bad boy and 
you know, and shooting with it. So yes, I have also heard the good things and I dropped the money to pick it up. And so we'll give it a try and see. Uh, and of course this, this could mount on, I think this one was a, let's see, I think this was a Nikon mount, if I'm not mistaken. They, I think it came in Canon and Nikon mounts. This is a Nikon mount and I've got a bunch of adapters. So I will, I will hook that baby up and we'll get some shooting done with that. I'm super excited about that as well. All right, now let's look at some of the images uh, that Wayne sent. So let me get these teed up here. And All right. Okay, so sent a few images um, and, and wanted to share some, uh, share some feedback. So, uh, this was an image. Let me, let me get myself uh, set up here so we can share and y'all can see what I'm looking at. Okay. So, uh, this was an image, uh, that Wayne had sent and I really like, um, the, uh, the contrast here between the the dark sky and the tree uh very nice so this is excellent and he also sent me a version to edit and this is the part where i'm, I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna say something that this is it's not a knock against you wayne it's just a an observation so let me share the um the the actual image itself the the sort of raw image and you can see one of the challenges uh that kind of presents itself here in fact let me go back to let me go back let me see if i can do a compare of these two versions. Now, by itself, the tree, of course, is a great subject, but you can see in the raw frame that you've got this other tree kind of off to the left, which you've clearly gotten, you made uh, disappear. Uh, and great, like if you want to do that, awesome. You, we can, as we can clearly see, the result uh, looks great. I, I get, I get, I've done en <laughs> enough of these of these kind of edits that I try not to do them anymore because it is super, you know, I want that lone tree out there to give me that great image, but I find it so frustrating trying to remove things from an image, um, using, you know, like going into Photoshop and, you know, kind of all that business. So I personally would try to avoid it at this point, just because I've done it. Um, I've fought with it too many times and it's, and it's frustrating to me, but kudos to you for pulling it off. Um, and if you want to, you know, if you want to go for this, then, then absolutely, you know, do that. Um, let's see. So a couple more images that, um, uh, that what's, oh, hang on. I'm, I'm caught in a loop. All right. So here was another image, um, that he sent over. So let's quick, take a quick look at this. Um, and, and look at the, some of the ways that we might process this. So this is interesting because um, this is a, let's see what we've got uh, from, a, if we look at this from a color perspective first, we get a, oh, let me get a good profile here and set a white balance. So you can see there's a little bit of color in this image. Um, and if we were to swap the colors, then we've got some variety here. We could pick one of these sort of styles of swapping. So if I kind of picked this style, um, and then, you know, the, the thing that to me, that's interesting here, that is, um, that I would look at for this image is maybe trying to bring down the highlights, uh, from some of these. I mean, we don't want them, we don't want them to go away entirely, but just kind of edge down the highlights a little bit. Um, and it looks like, so I can't tell because. It looks like you're using a vintage lens here. Um, so I can't tell what the, um, uh, what the, uh, uh f-stop was, but it looks like, it looks like a vintage lens. Cause I'm seeing a little bit of kind of haloing here and, and a little bit of, um, uh, chromatic aberration around some of the edges. Um, and it depends on where you focused. So this is kind of a challenging image because, um, the, you know, you've got this tree as a prominent element, but it's kind of out of focus. Um, and then you've got, uh, most of the dock is in focus and then the background. So, uh, it, 
it, that's going to depend on what f-stop you use. This this might be one of those, we were talking about uh, focus stacking. This might be one of those candidates uh, for a shot like that to, to deal, to, to manage the depth uh, that exists in here. So I like the composition, um, but be careful about the, um, uh, the, the, the depth of field uh, that exists with an image like this. Um, and then there was one more image uh, that Wayne shared as well. Let's take a look at that. Um, so here is, let me, let me reset this. This is another, uh, this is a, this is actually a, probably like an, an 850, 830, 850 nanometer image, um, because there's, we're not seeing a lot of color here. I'm going to do a quick auto. Uh, what I would do in an image like this is look for a monochrome profile. So you could go to black and white, which would pick up a camera standard. Um, you could go into the profile browser, um, and then you could either pick up uh, Adobe Monochrome or a camera matching profile, of which there are no black and white here, or you could go down to the B&W group and find um, a uh, find a tonal profile that is the most interesting to you. So it's going to depend on what kind of look you want. Do you, do you want a high contrast, low contrast? Um, ooh, this, this, I like the number eight one there. So you could kind of pick one of these, um, and then proceed to, to begin your edit. I really like this. Um, let me kick up the exposure here a little bit. Might be, might be a little underexposed. I really love the dark sky that, that creates a lot of, uh, beautiful contrast with the tree. Um, and then you can look at, uh, the tones in the tree in here. Um, and so nice, nice, nice image, nice composition. I like what, uh, the, the, um, an interesting sort of observation here is that if you're out shooting and you have completely clear skies, a, um, not completely clear, obviously there's a little bit of clouds in the distance, but largely clear skies. Then if you shoot with a, uh, 800 plus filter, you could really go for this dark sky look uh, that would be really nice here. So, uh, Wayne, thank you so much for sharing. Um, uh, I would, um, let's see. The other thing that I would do is I would consider maybe a lower ISO. Um, as we, as we mentioned earlier, you probably don't need, um, a high ISO. In fact, you're shooting at an eight thousandth of a second here. So maybe a low ISO would be fine. So definitely check that out. Um, and all right. Awesome. Thank you. All right. So let me, uh, catch up on comments here. All righty. Um, to do just kind of reading comments here um, oh here's a good one Phil from Phil have you thought about infrared for the full solar eclipse next year how would you guess the sun would look I haven't made any plans for this yet um, but the path of the full solar eclipse in 2024 is about I think about a four hour drive from me so totally within range and I'm absolutely planning to go. I just haven't made any sort of formal plans yet. Um, and I haven't thought about it from the photography perspective of, um, should I, sh what should I shoot it with? What filter or, you know, what methodology should I use? I probably should take a bunch of cameras and tripods and try a bunch of different ones. Cause, uh, it's one of those like, uh, you know, fleeting moments. It's not going to last very long. So, um, I, I, I don't know. I haven't thought about that yet. So I definitely got to invest some time in it. I don't want to wait until next year to start planning for this because this is one of those uh, rare events um, that, that, that um, doesn't come along very often. So I need to start thinking about, um, about what I want to do for shooting that. So thank you for the reminder, Phil. I appreciate that. Uh, I got to get, get some planning here. Uh, let's see. Uh, so Pat Pet said, that's what my image is was like because of diffraction, I shoot F8 and above. Oh my. <laughs> yep. I mean, this was, this was like, it's, it's, it's a learning thing. You know, I, I, I was the same way. I learned this as well. So, uh, that's, that's kind of part of the process. Um, what Canon lens is best for IR on a full spectrum converted camera? 
check the website, go to the lens drop down on my website and look for um, other um, other um, uh, resources that would be good for, for different cameras. I could tell you that obviously there's a ton of vintage lenses that would be great, um, but if you're looking for modern lenses, uh, probably primes. Um, primes tend to be better than zooms, but you'll have to look for the research that's been done for individual lenses. Um, fun fact, some minerals are infrared fluorescent. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, being a rock hound, it's actually what got me into IR. I have a, I have a friend who, um, uh, is a rock collector, uh, and uh, we've been meaning to kind of get together and merge our hobbies, um, and see if there's an, a crossover, uh, to, to do that. So maybe I'll do that at some point. Uh, let's see. Um, is there still a chance to give you an image today? That's going to be tough because I've got a ton and, um, and I've got more to go. So maybe not. Um, but I, but, but I think I'm going to start having these sessions more frequently, uh, because clearly there's lots of, lots of interest and lots of demand. Okay. So let's move on to, um, the next, the next set of uh, questions and images comes from John. Um, and his first question is how to deal with veins in IR. Um, so this is like portrait photography, um, and IR has a tendency to show veins. Um, I don't have any sample images to, to show to go over this. Uh, I haven't done any of this type of photography, so I guess I have sort of a few different thoughts on it. My first thought would be to embrace it, although, you know, I don't know if your, your, your subject <laughs> will feel the same way. Um, the, um, the next thought is, you know, there's probably a way to... Um, Certainly you could address it, you know, with, um, uh, in Photoshop or maybe even Lightroom, um, mask out, uh, the, the, the portion of it there, that would be one way to go. Um, that's tough. I mean, cause that's just the nature of IR is that it's going to show those, those sort of details. Um, we, we've talked about this a lot in, in, in past live streams because, um, IR has some really unique challenges when it comes to portrait photography in terms of like eyes, lips, makeup. Um, you know, we know that we know that there's certain subjects that look really good, like tattoos. In fact, I just saw an article, uh, yesterday about a photographer who did a series on, uh, NFL players and their tattoos in IR, which I thought that looked really cool. Um, but aside from that, um, I know that, that portrait IR work can be very challenging. Okay. So John submitted a couple images. So let's take a look at those and maybe do some maybe do some image editing image editing and critiquing uh let's see okay so let me find them okay so the first one we'll look at is kind of more of a critique um it's a jpeg so we'll just kind of take a take a peek at this one and so this is let's see so john says hello i submitted two photos, but I had a different request for each image. Uh, for the one on the road, I'd like a critique. This was shot with a 550 filter, I believe. Uh, and then I'll talk about the other one in a second. So looking at this image, um, so yeah, clearly 550, just, you know, a wash in uh, this, you know, super vibrant color. Um, and, you know, I, I, I love, uh, I, th I, I think that I really like the 550. And I think that, you know, the, the challenge for any sort of photographer is to figure out the amount of saturation that works in a given image. Now, in this case, um, I love the bold colors. The sky looks amazing. Um, and you know, my only, I guess my only critique here is I might look at the road and maybe like, maybe if you removed some of the saturation from the road and made it like more of a gray tone, uh, then, then that would stand out more and separate it from the sky. But uh, aside from that, I really like the vibrant colors, um, and um, it really works. It really works in this image, and it really works with the clouds. So, uh, yeah, I think this one looks great. Um, uh, I just get back to, like, you know, for me personally, I'm I'm always, like, trying to figure out what I want to say with the saturation. Um, and there's times when I, I take an image and this, this sort of bold saturation really works, and there's sometimes when I want a more subdued look from, like, a 720. Um, no right and wrong here. Um, but, but, but think about that when you're shooting, um, you know, the kind of, um, 
impression you want to leave. But this, this image definitely leaves a, a very bold impression. All right, so let's, let me pull up the other image uh, that John submitted. This one is really interesting. First of all, I'm going to share um, his JPEG, um, and then I'll read uh, his comment here. So this is the JPEG, and he says, uh, for the person, I was looking for advice about dealing with the skin tone shift that was happening in the hands and the lips. What could I do in pre-production or worse in post-production to deal with the issue? This was shot with a Hoya R72. Um, both images are from a full spectrum uh, Canon EOS M camera. Thanks. So you can see we've got, um, uh, what's interesting about this image is that it's a, it's a, a Hoya R72, so it's a 720 nanometer, which would normally have very subdued color. And John has kind of amped up the color here a little bit. Um, so let's, let's talk about this. So, um, first of all, uh, as I was just mentioning uh, earlier, like portrait stuff is so hard. Um, and skin tones are like challenging with Caucasian people. The skin looks, you know, sort of zombie like with, you know, darker skin like this, it definitely changes the tone of the skin. And so amping up the colors, uh, you know, kind of compensates for that, but it also creates some challenges as you see here specifically in the lips and in the fingernails. Um, so there's a lot going on here. So let me share, um, let me share my, uh, version of this image. So I, I, I looked at this image and I, I kind of, when, when, when John first sent me this image, um, I had a little conversation with him cause I was a little, you know, this was a little challenging to me, uh, about, you know, what I wanted to do with this image. Um, and so I actually spent a little bit of time on this image, uh, and I want to share with you, uh, what I did with this image. So first of all, uh, let me share what the image looked like. Um, originally. So let's see here. So this is the image uh, straight out of camera. And if I was to do go negative 50, which is probably good for a 720 and then get a color balance on it, you can see, okay, so this is what we're dealing with sort of before, you know, with a, with just a white balance. So you can see the colors are very muted. Um, and, uh, you know, the skin tone is washed out. Um, and a lot of the color is washed out. This is sort of, you know, normal that you'd see for this kind of thing. So let's look at what I did. So let me go to the snapshot version of what I did and pull that up. And <clears throat> the reason that I wanted to spend some time on this is because I wanted to work on the masks. Um, and let me show you what I did with the masks. So I went a little crazy here with the masks. So I've got a mask of the entire sky. Uh, which a lot, let me turn the overlay on, which allowed me to, um, to just deal with the sky. And then I, I've got another mask for the lower sky. Cause there was some challenges there that I wanted to deal with. Then I wanted a mask for just the background. And you can see that there's a, there's a whole combination of things going on here. There's the background subtracting a person, subtracting a sky, some brushwork to just get the background. And this, this, what this allowed me to do was tweak the color temperature a little bit of just the background, uh, and add a little bit of contrast and also reduce the texture and clarity so that I could create a little separation. Um, one of the challenges with this image is of course it's a portrait, um, but it had a lot of depth of field. And so I wanted to create a little more separation. So the negative texture, negative clarity allowed me to, uh, knock some of the background out a little bit, soften it up just a hair to bring more focus to the subject. Then when it comes to the subject itself, I created a mask uh, for the subject um, and I did just a little bit of tweaking on the, the temperature. Um, this is one of the things that I like about um, the masking. And if you ever watched, I did a video called like triple white balance where there's all these zones of white balance needs in the image and masking allows you to deal with that. So I did a little bit of a tweak here with the color temperature and kicked up the saturation a lot, um, so that we could bring back some of that skin tone. Uh, we don't want them to look too washed out. Um, and so did that with the person and then, uh, texture and clarity to increase that. Then I got into fashion. Oh boy, I'm, I'm getting out of my, I'm getting out of my element here now. So, so I, I created a mask for the shoes and socks so that I could 
I want to really sharpen up, you know, create a lot of punch in the shoes. And so a lot of texture and clarity to kick that up um, and some contrast and a little bit of a hint of a temperature shift here as well up the, the exposure to really bring that up. And then in the pants, I created like a couple objects and some brushes to try to just isolate the pants because I wanted to really bring that saturation up, add some contrast, texture and clarity, all that stuff. Um, and then uh, for the shirt, I wanted it to, to be just very white and bright um, and stand out. So I wanted a, a separate mask for the shirt um, and that allowed me to basically kick up the exposure a bit and add some contrast, bring up the whites uh, to, to bring that in. Then uh, I, deal, I dealt with the, the challenging aspects that John brought up. So starting with, um, you know, I, I did a mask for just the uh, lips and fingernails um, and oh, I got a stray brush over here on the left that I missed. Um, but you can see, I just went in and mask those, uh, so that I could address those specifically. I actually, for the, for the lips I did, there's a, there's this, the person. So it's, let me show you, it's kind of cool as a, as a landscape photographer, I don't get to deal with this very often. So this was kind of cool. If I go into masks and select, select people, what's really cool is that Lightroom will, it'll do, it'll detect people. Um, and then once it finds the person, if you haven't seen this before, some of you certainly have, um, you, you'll find the person and you can select that person. It'll, this will work if there's multiple people in the image, then it will detect their features. And so I can begin to isolate things like, um, uh, facial skin, body skin, eyebrows, eyes, lips, hair, color. And I, and I would work through some of these to create some of my masks. Um, and that's how I was able to to get a starting point for some of these. Many of them needed like a, another object or a brush uh, to kind of finish them off. Uh, but if I go back to the um, lips and fingernails, which were kind of the, one of the challenging aspects of this image, um, you can see I started with person lips, added a brush to get the fingernails in. Um, and then I did a little bit of a, that color temperature shift here um, uh, to, to really that, I mean, that was really it. Look, increasing some saturation, um, so that it, that it looks a little bit, you can see that the, obviously the nails and the palms of the hands are still going to be a little, uh, lighter, but they don't have that color shift as much because of this little bit of a shift. And then I did another one with the face and the skin because I wanted to kind of counteract some of that washed out look that tends to happen in infrared. Um, so a little bit of contrast and dealing with shadows and, and the blacks, um, and some, um, uh, some tone curve here. So this is... Uh, my iteration of the image. And if we, let's see if I do a comparison. I don't know if these are next to each other. Uh, yep. Oh, okay. So, so this is the version th that I have on the left and this is the version that John submitted. Um, and the things that, you know, by, by create, by creating this mask, what it allowed me to do was put a little bit more character and color into the face, which I like, of course, dealt with the the lips and skin, and I kind of subdued the background a little bit more compared to John Sky. Um, and I made, the, I, I got a little crazy with the pants. I, <laughs> I want, I thought about it going even crazier, but I, I tried to hold myself back. Um, but you know, lots of opportunities here with, uh, with the mask, but definitely, definitely challenging, more challenging, um, to deal with a, um, a, a, a portrait, a subject, uh, a human subject in infrared, uh, super challenging, but thanks John, uh, for sending this image and giving me the opportunity to, to work on this. I actually had a lot of fun working on this edit. Uh, it got me into some of the masking stuff that I haven't had an opportunity to play with as much. Um, and I'm really, uh, happy with the result there. So thank you so much for, for sharing this image. All right. So let's see here. Uh, let me see where we're at on, um, all right. So let's see. So, oh, I should, I should take a break here and just remind everybody, um, I should, I, sh I should have been doing this more frequently, uh, to, for, for our giveaway. Um, so we have, uh, our giveaway for this live stream and the way that you, uh, participate in this giveaway is to go to uh, uh, the website uh, 590.red slash giveaway. 
that will take you to a form where you can enter your name and email address. I'm just using the email to contact the prize winner for no other reason. Um, and um, be sure to enter the code 99. That allows me to know that you are actually here uh, and, and actually participated. Um, so if you, if you uh, enter in uh, your code uh, and your stuff, then you will be submitted. And about one hour from now, we will do a drawing uh, for the for a winner of my book. Color doesn't exist because color is an illusion that only exists in your brain. Um, and we will do that. You don't need to be present. I'll have your information um, if you're not present at that time. No worries. Uh, so everybody who's attended fills out this form and anybody who submitted anything for this uh, is great as well. Let me check on the comments here. Uh, let's see. Uh, greetings from South Africa. Uh, welcome. Thanks for coming. All right. So let's see here. Let's move on. I had a question, uh, that was submitted to me. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll leave this up on the screen so you guys can see the, um, uh, the, the link for the, for the giveaway while you're all, uh, 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 entering the giveaway. So I had a question from Michael, um, and it wasn't, it wasn't necessarily part of the a live stream question, but it, but it was really, um, it really hit me. And so I wanted to share, I'm going to read the question for you. It was, um, um, uh, some, some about comments in the photos being in the, so this is about, uh, the thought that, um, infrared photography is sort of unnatural. Um, so he says, I have been into infrared photography, infrared photography for several months now. I have bought your wonderful book. Uh, very informative. Thank you so much. Uh, and also downloaded the infrared profile pack and bought the color swap profiles. But the comments that I hear are things like unnatural. He regularly hears that pr presumably from uh, other people he's sharing his work with. Um, obviously, it's a difficult item to imagine. But the question is and remains, should you do it? Should you do infrared photography? Um, should you compare infrared photography with visible light photography and the pictures obtained from it, or should you view it as a separate form of photography? What is your opinion on this? Um, so this is tricky. Um, and because I deal with this, I even deal with this, you know, with my own, you know, family members, um, when people look at some of the work that I've done and just, they just say it's unnatural or you, they're expecting, you know, there's an expectation for what a landscape photo should look like uh, that, that exists in the public eye. And when you create something that doesn't meet that expectation, then um, sometimes people will say, wow, that's an interesting take on that. And sometimes people will say, well, it, it doesn't look right. <laughs> it looks unnatural. It looks wrong um, even. Um, and I think that there's a couple of reasons for this. So one of them is that photography is it's for, one of the challenges with photography is that it is both a, um, an art form and a method of, of capturing reality. It's a tool for capturing reality. And so if you, um, if you are a photojournalist, you know, your, your intention is to capture reality, but if you're an artist, your objective is to create interesting art. Um, and this doesn't, this isn't limited to visual light photography. This also applies to, to infrared and ultraviolet. Uh, if you are a, uh, forensics crime lab, uh, sort of, uh, person, you might use ultraviolet photography on a crime scene, uh, to, to, to reveal information that's trying to capture facts that exist. Um, if you are a farmer, you might be using infrared photography to look at the quality of your crops, like say an aerial infrared photography. So, so, and those are again, trying to capture facts that are not available to you. But the, um, the, the intent there is different than an artistic intent. Um, and so I, as somebody who's kind of pushed through this myself, I would encourage you to view the work that you do as artistic and and develop yourself as an artist. That's hard. I mean, that, you know, that, that can be really challenging as some for, especially if you don't have like, uh, you know, if you have a artistic background or an artistic training, it might come naturally to you to view yourself that way. But if you don't, that might be challenging to, to, to think about. Um, but I encourage you to do that. 
And I encourage you when you're, when you're working on your photography, um, whether it's infrared or any other kind of photography, whatever, look at it as an artistic endeavor and, and experiment and try to do the things that are inter visually interesting to you. And sometimes those are not going to resonate with your audience. Some of my absolute favorite images that I create, I put them on say Instagram and they get the least number of likes, um, from anybody. And you know, how, how, what do you, what do you do with that? You know, how do you, how do you think about that? That can be frustrating. Um, that can be challenging. People are not seeing, you know, the vision, you know, like people see, uh, they, they, people respond to certain things, but differently to other things. Um, and maybe, maybe that image that, that I really like, maybe it would be, maybe that's the wrong medium. Maybe Instagram doesn't show off that image. Maybe it needs to be a print or shown in a gallery, um, or, uh, some other format. Um, so, uh, that's okay. That's okay. I mean, this to me, uh, I say it a lot, but, but like, this really is a journey. It's a journey for me as well as it is for you. I'm learning all the time. I'm trying to explore my creativity, my creative eye, uh, and trying to figure out, um, what I like, what, what looks good. And then what does it say? What is the, what is the resulting image that I create say? Uh, there's no easy answers to these things, but, um, if, if you find yourself surrounded by people who, um, don't appreciate your imagery or don't, aren't capable of seeing it in a way, well then try to find some new people to surround yourself with. There's, there's different groups out there and, uh, you could find, you know, Facebook groups or you could find, uh, other forums where you can talk to people and express yourself. And I would encourage you to do that because, you know, you're not always going to get that in your, in your normal circles. And that's okay. That's okay. Not everybody has to share, uh, the same, the same vision you have, you know, when, when in, in my home, you know, when we have a blank wall and we talk, I talk with my wife about what's going to go on that blank wall. And I'm like this, you know, a, a giant infrared image would look amazing right here. Um, uh, that's not always a sentiment that's shared. <laughs> And so that's okay. That's okay. Uh, we'll, we find the right places for those. Um, and, um, uh, but that, but don't like stop doing art. Don't stop doing photography because of that. You may, you may just need a different sort of feedback channel, um, uh, to, to, to share with. So, so continue to explore. Um, don't give up, don't give up on it, uh, and push through those, those challenges. All right. So let's move on. Um, I've got uh, some images from Phil that we want to take a look at. So let me find those and pull those up. Let's see here. And see what we want to talk about. So Phil has some interesting images to share. Let's, let's start with um, sort of a, sort of a conventional, conventional image. We'll look at an edit. Um, and so let me pull this up here. Oops. Nope. Don't need that twice. Ah. Okay. Let's do this. All right. So here's an image, uh, that Phil shared of a, uh, winery. Um, and so let's, let's take a look at this image and, uh, let's see here. I want to, he, he also sent a, this is a JPEG, but he also sent a raw version. So let's take a look at the raw version and work on an edit. Okay, so the first thing that I want to do is pick a profile. I'll go with my infrared temp negative 100. I'm going to white balance on the building. That'll give me um, a pretty good starting point. No clouds here, but uh, good good color balance from the building. That gives me a nice separation of the, the uh, light blue foliage and the golden sky. I'm going to hit auto here just to kind of bring the brightness up a little bit. Kind of give me a good level. Now let's look at swapping colors. Um, and this is my first opportunity to have that creativity and think about what I want to say. Um, and this is a reason that I like having different choices in the color swap profiles, um, because, because each one of them is yes, a different technique, but I think less about the tech. Now that I have these here, I think less about the technique that was behind them and about what is the result? What are the colors that I'm going to get? 
um, out of these. Um, and so these, you know, get these interesting choices and it's particularly the more radical ones like, like this, this, um, shifting the green channel to red, which gives me these great sort of pinks and greens or the, uh, the blue channel. You know, I think this, I'm going to go crazy with this one and pick this image, this, this profile, because I like the, uh, the, the sort of grape sky here um, uh, that, that we're going to have. So let's make a couple uh, changes to this. So the first thing that I want to do is I want to bring out this, um, the, the building here. It's kind of a little bit hidden in this image. And so let's grab this and I'm going to do a mask uh, object. And I will just do a quick, super quick grab of this. This is what I love about this object tool. I've been using this so much more and more lately because it just very quick, it's so much faster than a brush and it allows me to get very specific about what I'm grabbing. So I'm just going to take the exposure and bring that up a little bit. Uh, that's good. We'll add some contrast. We'll do a little bit of a tone curve, love, strong contrast. So that'll, that'll pop the, the building a little bit more. The next thing that I want to do is, uh, deal with, uh, you know, kind of reducing the color here. You could do that a couple ways. You could probably the easiest way is if I go back to my main editor. Um, and then go down to HSL and go to luminance and grab my little picker here. And if I grab the image, this will help me drag down, darken a little bit the, the yellows here. So they're not so, not so bright. So you can kind of find a balance here uh, for what those look like. While I'm here, maybe I'll address the sky. Maybe I'll pull a little bit of saturation out of the sky to get it to be not such a a grape jam and a little bit more of a, <laughs> a lighter grape there. Um, and so now what I think let's do some, let's do a little bit more complicated of a mask so that I can, I can apply some, um, uh, effects to the foliage. So let's start with, let's do a quick, uh, sky. We're going to, we're going to do a quick, uh, uh, combination of masks to try to get me, I'm trying to get all the foliage, but I don't want other stuff. So we'll start with the sky. I'm going to click invert. That'll give me everything but the sky. And then I'm going to do subtract object. And then I'll do a quick subtraction of this building. Cause I know that'll do a pretty good job of pulling that out. Um, and now I've got some other nuances here. I could go in and clean up, but that'll give me a pretty good selection of, uh, all of the greenery, if you will, in this image. And now I can add a little bit more contrast to that as well. So go into the, the curve. I'm using the curve so much more these days now that it's in masks. It's absolutely awesome. Uh, fantastic. Uh, bring up a little contrast, maybe nudge the highlights down a hair. So there we go. So that's looking pretty good. So that is, that is my take um, on, uh, this image. Uh, let's see if we can do a comparison. So uh, no right, no wrong here, just a couple different uh, varieties to look at. Um, so I wanted to like emphasize the building a little bit more, um, and just try some, some fun colors. Um, but, uh, here's a couple, uh, varieties and whichever one, you know, interests you and gets you the look you're looking for, you know, go for it. So, uh, thank you for that, Phil. Um, let's see, there was a, another, some other images. So, um, some abstracts that were really interesting. I'll share those with you. Uh, so this is, I love the, this is fascinating, sort of these patterns that exist here. Um, so this is more of kind of an abstract art, uh, from, from infrared, which is really awesome. And then there was one more here again, almost, almost looks like a, like a, um, uh, aerial, uh, image but another, another abstract, uh, take on this. And then the other thing that, uh, that, um, Phil shared was, uh, a pano. So let's go ahead and, and build that pano. He's got his version. Let's look at his version quick. Um, so you can see we've got a lighthouse and some rock formations and then a lot of rocks here in the foreground. So let's go back and show you what I would do to build a pano. So I would grab all of these and then right click and select photo merge panorama. And now Lightroom will do its thinking. Um, and you know, you can play your Jeopardy theme here while it's doing its work. And so now it's, it's, it's creating this look now. Um, 
there, there's a couple options here. You could, you can, because the merge is in, in Lightroom is going to create uh, a DNG file. You don't need to swap colors or even set a white balance ahead of time. So that's not a big deal. Um, you could do it before you could do it after it doesn't, it doesn't really matter. Um, I'm going to turn off auto crop just so I can see kind of what I'm dealing with here. And you can see this is, this is like eight images. Although if you look up here, it says one of the images wasn't able to be merged. So maybe, maybe there was, uh, some lack of overlap between your images, but, but the amount of cropping needed shows me that Phil did a really good job here of, of keeping the camera steady, uh, as he, as he moved over for these. Um, and that was pretty good. Don't know why one of them didn't sort of make the cut, uh, but that's okay. What I'll typically do is try these different projections. Uh, the projections will give you some different looks. Um, so I would encourage you to try each of the projections. Sometimes they can be radically different, um, between images. And so it's worth looking at them to kind of get a feel. Uh, these ones are not so different. They're all pretty much the same. Um, so you've got a couple choices now, uh, you can auto crop, which would just simply crop in on the image. You can do a boundary warp, which will fill in. It'll stretch everything that's there up to the edge. Um, that is one solution, or you can do a fill edges. And this would be where, uh, Lightroom would use its AI fanciness to try to guess what the edges are. Um, I, I actually sometimes do a combination. I don't, I haven't done a lot of the fill edges or the, what I, maybe what I should say is the ones I've done have been, they've mixed. It either totally works or totally doesn't. Um, sometimes I will do what I like about the boundary warp is that you can pick a range on it. So I'll frequently pick maybe about halfway, um, and to get me better and then do an auto crop, or you could then do a fill edges. Um, and so some, some kind of balance there. This one is not so bad. This one probably could just survive with an auto crop. Some of my panos are not as clean uh, in the the alignment. So you end up with more stuff being cropped out and the boundary warp can really help with that. So then I would uh, merge these together and we'll, we'll get those going. Uh, let's see, while that's happening, I'll um, see what's happening in the chat here. Um... Uh, how do you decide whether to start with a negative 50 or negative 100? So, um, the, the general rule of thumb for me is that the negative 50 works better with, um, uh, 720 nanometer filters and the negative 100 works better with, um, uh, 590 nanometer filters, but that can be like some cameras are a little different. Nikon sensors are a little different. Um, so the, that's my, that's my shortcut, but the reality is, is it doesn't matter which, which of them you use. They both do the same thing just to a different amount. So whichever one gets you a good white balance that's off of that 2000 Kelvin mark is the one that you want to use. Um, and so, uh, either one is fine. Okay. So my, my pano is merged and now I can go through and I'm going to, I'll do some quick, I'll grab my, the negative 100 here. Um, grab a part of this and now you can start to see the infrared characteristics of this. We've got the, uh, the gold sky and the, uh, blue, uh, organic life here on the rocks. Uh, I could pick a, oh, let's see here. I'm going to pause here cause I'm getting a, a message from YouTube. Let me stop and restart my streaming just to be sure. <clears throat> okay, so just a little qu quick nudge to the streaming and it looks like we're back we're back to good. Okay, so now I can pick, you know, from here um most of the edit is going to be similar to any other infrared image, but I'll point out a couple things to be aware of. Um so first of all, um one thing to be aware of when you're doing a panorama and I didn't see this in Phil's version but sometimes you're going to end up with these vertical lines that exist. Uh, let me do, let me find a good range here. Okay. So sometimes you'll get these, you can see these vertical lines that exist between the images. So if your infrared lens has a little bit of vignetting, even if it's very subtle, you might not notice that in a single frame, 
but if you're if you're creating a panorama you're going to get uh, like repeating uh vertical lines that, that will happen um across the image um and so you might see a few of those and it could be more dramatic and so when you're doing a pano in infrared you might want to leave more uh have more overlap between the images so uh for example in a typical pano i might try to overlap a third of the frame well maybe in infrared i want to overlap like half of the frame uh so to, to, to try to avoid some of that uh, vignetting that would come in so that's definitely something to be aware of but aside from that then the process is going to be you know a very traditional edit from this point the only other thing that i that i have to decide whenever i'm doing a pano is what's the what's the aspect ratio that i'm looking for um if i'm if you're printing you know, or, or working with a printer, you might be limited to certain aspect ratios like two to one or three to one. And so that might be something to be aware of. And that could affect, you know, how you, um, how you align the image. Um, or do you go for something like a three to one and then you have, you know, different things to deal with. And then you've got a, there's, there's other sort of compositional things to think about when you're, when you're dealing with a pano. Uh, but, but really for me, from an infrared perspective, at least, the main thing to watch out for is those vertical lines. I've had a few images that um, I was either very disappointed in the outcome because I couldn't get rid of those lines, or it took me a lot of time in post-production to eliminate those. And again, I didn't see those in, if we go back to, you know, Phil's version, um, let's see, then he didn't have those. So either he used a different program or he cleaned those up. Um, to, but dealing with those vertical lines is sort of definitely a challenge. Um, so thank you for sharing all of those images, Phil. I really appreciate it. All righty, let's see here. Let me catch up on uh, the the chat while I'm doing that. I'm going to throw um, the, the live stream banner up. So if you haven't uh, yet, you should sign up for the giveaway. So go to um, 590.red slash giveaway, enter the code 99 and your information. Uh, and then, um, at the end, uh, when we're, when we're close to, uh, probably about 45 minutes from now, we will draw a winner, a uh, winner. Um, all righty. Let's see here. Let me see how I'm doing here. I was feeling pretty good, but then y'all bombarded me with questions and images in the last couple days. So I got a lot going on, a lot going on here. Uh, let's see here. Let me check the chat here. Uh, okay. All right. So next up, I've got some questions and images from Susan, who's here uh, in the chat. So Susan, thank you for sending your, uh, your images and your questions. So let's see here. Um, let me find uh, the first one that we want to talk about. Uh, da, 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 da. Okay. Okay. So this is, this is good. So this is an interesting one. So let me share the challenge uh, that she's having with this image. Um, should be readily apparent. So in this image, so I'll, I'll read uh, her comments here. Um, I've submitted this file. I have one or two similar files that show very dark leaves at the top. Um, almost as if I had dragged a graduated filter, you know, kind of up in this space, um, uh, over the tree in Adobe camera raw. Um, I used a helio pan 550 orange filter, uh, set a custom, uh, white balance from a white card. Um, and then set, uh, and then the workflow in Adobe camera raw was calibration set to negative 100, um, white balance set on the road. So you've got uh, white balance you could do on the road. You've got these clouds in the background. Those would all be good white balance subjects. Um, before doing a channel swap in, um, in um, uh, Photoshop 6. If you have any suggestions, we'll be grateful. Thanks, Sue. Okay, so let's, let's take a look at the... Uh, this is the, this is the JPEG. Let's take a look at the raw version of this. So, um, so let me just start a basic edit and then I'll kind of share my thoughts as I go. Um, so the first thing of course we would do is pick that profile. We'll go with that negative 100. You could click on the road. I'll do the same thing. You could also click on the clouds. Um, and then, you know, now let's do a color swap again. 
Uh, she did this in Photoshop, but very similar results if we just grab one of the color swaps. Um, so I'll just do that here to save some time. And let's look at some of the different ones that are here and see if any of these have that effect. And then I'd like to talk about what I think is causing that effect. Okay, so none of the color swaps seem to be introducing that, that effect. So I don't think that that's a problem. So let me just pick one of those. Um, and, I, and the more I looked at this image, um, there's a couple things that, that occurred to me. So the first thing that, it, that I noticed, well, if I look at the metadata for this image, um, I can see that um, this was shot with, uh, let's see, this is a, a Fuji X-T1 on the, the 14 millimeter uh, lens, which is, which is the lens that I love to get frustrated with um, because it is a, it's a, it's a great lens uh, and it's probably one of the widest, you know, we were talking earlier about good wide lenses for Fuji. It's one of the widest that will get you no hot spots, but occasionally it just has this weird sort of vignetting thing that's happening around the image um, that, and it depends on like the angle of the sun or something. I don't get it in every image, but I get it occasionally when I get it, it's not obvious. It's annoying. Um, and one of the things that I noticed, uh, in this image is if I, if I just turn up the clarity, was it the clarity? Uh, no, I think it was the D haze. If I crank up the dehaze, now obviously I wouldn't use this much dehaze as an image, but I think you can kind of see when I crank up the dehaze, you, you're starting to see that the, some of the weird effects that happen with the 14 millimeter lens. So I'm getting these darker, uh, darker branches around the edges and not so much in the middle. And of course the edges of the sky are getting really crazy. Um, now again, I know that like we're not going to use that high of a dehaze, but I'm wondering, Sue, if one of the settings that you're using is similar to that. Um, it could be, let me just do a quick auto here. See if, if I look through a variety of settings and if I just try contrast, um, texture, clarity, I see, I see it shows up a little bit in clarity. It's really D haze, uh, where this shows up the most. So I don't know, none of the, the, the settings you mentioned were, were doing that. Um, and certainly I don't think a channel mixer would do it. Um, so this is a tricky one. Um, it could be something related to dehaze or some similar setting that's causing that. I've definitely seen that effect in the past. Um, what I would encourage you to do is, um, play around with some of the other settings and see if there's something that's causing it specifically. Um, uh, to see if you can narrow it down, but I think it might be the lens. Um, uh, I think it might be just kind of a natural issue with that lens. Could be clarity. Yeah. So just keep an eye on those settings. Um, my, my go-to for these present settings is always to just try to, uh, not overdo them. Uh, or if you want to overdo them, use a mask because then that'll allow you to be very selective about where you're, where you're overdoing it. Um, so check out that. Um, another image, um, that, uh, Sue shared, I want to take a look at. This is really cool. So let me show this on the screen. So this is, uh, following from a mention in your last stream about photographing flowers. I've uploaded an image. I took a lot of flowers during lockdown with my full spectrum converted Fuji X-T1. I found an orange filter of 550, which, um, it, sidebar for me is going to let in more visible light and more color. Uh, we'll, we'll get into the image. Um, worked well on my Fuji 80 millimeter macro and also the 14 millimeter lens. Uh, red tomatoes and poppies will be white after channel swapping. I had some fun creating the composition from all the flowers in the garden. So this is, this is really awesome uh, because you've, you know, one of the challenges we've talked about in the past streams is, is how, uh, uniform, uh, flowers can look in infrared. And by, by taking the, the orange filter, which is going to bring in more light and showing, shooting a variety of flowers and then bringing them all together in this chocolate box format, it's really awesome. 
this is so cool because it brings in all of these styles together. Um, and instead of trying to like, uh, just pull out color from one, you're showing us a whole variety. Uh, so this is really awesome. Thank you for sharing the image, um, and the technique behind it. Uh, because that's really cool. That's really cool. I really like this image. Um, let's see. Uh, let's see. Sue said in combination with this lens, I have other shots with different lenses without the problem. So again, this is my, my love frustration with the, the 14 millimeter when it's great, it's great. Um, and when it's not great, it's frustrating. <laughs> um, uh, so I got to get me that, 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 uh, a Zeiss 12 millimeter, um, as well. So I can give that one a try. I got to try out this other Zeiss first, but, uh, then I'll, then I'll, then I'll get on the 12 millimeter. Um, let's see. Oh, and some other comments. Is it possible to get color when using a 720 nanometer filter, but it'll depend on the flower species and the light conditions. So yes, but you know, for this subject matter, my, so tech, Let's talk, let's talk technically and then practically. So technically, um, the lower, the high pass cutoff, so say a 550 compared to a 720 is going to let in more varieties of light, of visible light. So you, you're going to bring in, uh, at, at 720, you're only going to get the reds. Um, but then as you go down, you're going to get, uh, oranges and then yellows. Um, and then at, down at, um, 550, you're, you're bringing in a ton of, not a ton, but like a broader variety of these colors, whereas the 720 is just going to bring in red only. And so for shooting subjects like this, I would stay towards, I would use, continue to use the orange filter because you're going to get those three different, broadly speaking of the primary rainbow colors, uh, three to four more visible light colors. Whereas 720 is only going to get you the red. And in general, if I look at infrared photography in general, the, the rule that I follow is that the higher the cutoff, the, the lower the color saturation. Um, so 720 just gets you a very subdued saturation and um, uh, 550, 515, whatever, gets you a very high saturation. But it's more to it than that, especially with subjects like this, you're going to get a lot more, um, I think, tonal interesting color changes from a 550. So I don't, I don't know that necessarily a 720 is gonna, is gonna improve any of this. It, it would probably just make them less saturated, which I don't think is gonna work with this subject matter. So I, I, I think the 550 is a good choice. Uh, let's see here. All right, so if you have not yet done so, be sure to, um, be sure to uh, submit your, your entry to our giveaway so you can receive a chance to win a copy of Color Doesn't Exist. Color is an illusion that only exists in your brain. It does not exist in the real world. Um, it is the, the real world is faking you. Your eyes and brain are faking you out, and it, all the details are in this book. So uh, submit at 590.red slash giveaway. Enter the code 99 for a chance to win. We will do that. Uh, let's see here. Oh, in about a half hour. All righty. Let's cover some more stuff here. Uh, da, 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 da. Uh, Anne said, I was wondering if you've had a chance to use the new Fujifilm XF 30 millimeter macro lens for infrared. Uh, I don't know if anyone's tried it. I do not. I have not tried it. I don't know if anyone else has. Um, but if anybody has, feel free to, um, send me the, um, send me, uh, the information and I'll update my lens page with that information. Um, Phil, I like the, the lens flare above the R, you know, it's funny because, um, I have grown, I have warmed to lens flares. Uh, and there are times like in that image where I, I really like the lens flare. There are also times, um, when I will block it by, you know, holding my hand up just over out of frame to block the lens flare. It just depends on where it's falling in the image. Um, but yeah, sometimes I really like it. Okay. Let's see here. Um, the next up is a question from Augie dealing with faint hotspots lenses used 
in this in, in this case is a 24 millimeter 1.4 prime uh, typically using f4 or f5.6 on a full spectrum converted Canon 70D not too noticeable but just noticeable enough question is how do you repair them in Lightroom and Photoshop so I have a couple different videos um, and let me share let me see if I can find those and share them in the chat uh, let's see here. I will click on them and let me share the links in the chat. So there's, so there's two videos that I've done that talk about, um, this. So the first one, let's see if I can throw this in the chat here. Um, let's see. Okay. This first video that I'm putting in the chat, don't watch it now, watch it later. These are for later. Save, click on them and then hit pause save them for later. Um, so this first one, how to fix hotspots in infrared photos. Um, this gets into a lot of details on addressing hotspots. Really the short version is you're going to use, um, uh, radial, uh, filters, um, to address hotspots, uh, like in Lightroom or, or other, uh, radial gradients, um, would be the way to go. And then the second video is not specifically about, um, about, um, uh, hotspots, but it covers them because it's about uh, mobile phone photography. And the interesting thing about mobile phone photography is that you don't have any control over your lenses. And so um, it's important to know how to how to tackle those uh, hotspots in mobile phone um, images. And so in that video, uh, what's different about that second video is that I did a, um, I shot some pavement um, and then did a, uh, uh, some radial gradients to eliminate the hotspots. And then I saved them as a preset, um, which is critical if you're going to use that lens repeatedly, uh, because then that will help you to just apply the fix through a preset over and over again. So check out those two videos. Uh, those are where you will get, um, good information on fixing hotspots. Again, they're called, the first one is how to fix hotspots in infrared photos. The second one is called, uh, infrared on iPhone or any mobile phone. Um, so I put links in the chat or search for them on my channel and you'll be able to find those. Uh, and those will help you to deal with hotspots. My, my general philosophy on hotspots is that if they are simple, um, and like faint circles, go for it, fix them. If they're complex, little sharp, weird shaped things, then probably not just, I would avoid those lenses. I've got some lenses like that where it's just not even worth trying to fix them. So, but if you could fix them, fix them. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Stitch says, I recommend the Zeiss Tesser 50 millimeter F 2.8 for infrared. I tested a lot of lenses, but this one, uh, at F four to F eight performed with perfect sharpness, no chromatic aberrations, no hotspots. You can get it for 20 bucks, 20 bucks. Ooh, that sounds like my kind of vintage lens. I'm, I'll, have to, I'll have to look into that as I start to build my collection of Zeiss lenses. Okay, so let's move on and look at some images uh, that were submitted by Keith. Um, so let me, uh, let me find these images and we'll pull them up and then we can talk about them. Uh, let's see. Keith. Oh, yes. All right, here we go. Let's pull up. He shared a JPEG and uh, also provided a RAW if we want to look at that. So let's let's start with the JPEG. Okay, so this is the JPEG from Keith. He says, hi, Rob, I've dabbled with infrared on and off for many years, but recently found your website and spent a lot of time learning from it. Awesome. I have a Fujifilm X-E1, which I converted to a 590 nanometer infrared some years ago and have started experimenting with it again. My very first attempts were with a Canon PowerShot G2 with a 720 nanometer filter, which was a much greater challenge. I've attached a photo taken yesterday with the X-E1. Uh, so your email today had a touch of synchronicity, so decided to share it. Uh, it's been processed in Lightroom uh, using your techniques for your videos. Thank you so much. Uh, so thanks for sharing. Um, so let me, let me, um, what's cool about this 
is let me switch over to the um, the raw version. Let's see here. Let's see, find out what I'm okay. And what's nice is that he shared the XMP file for this, which basically meant he shared the whole edit right in Lightroom. So I'm looking at the raw file now, and I can see that he created a 590, 590 nanometer channel mixing profile for this. And then I can see all of the settings that he did in Lightroom. So we're not going to do a full edit on this, but I'll just throw in some observations. So um, first thing that comes to mind is... Uh, be careful with your, with fringing. So if I zoom in here, uh, let me go into hundred percent. You could start to see, and I'll, I'll go to 200% just for, to make it easier to see on the stream. Um, you could start to see color fringing around the edge here. Um, and so that can be challenging and let's, uh, l definitely a problem when it comes to uh, altering colors. Let's kind of dig into this a little bit, um, and see, I'm going to, I think that this might be down happening down in HSL. Yeah. So if we look down in the hue, you've got the, the hue really cranked up. If I turn off the blue, yeah, that's the one right here. So this blue shifting all the way over is, um, affecting, uh, that's what's creating that this, this HSL, it doesn't know how to deal with colors that are that are blending from the foliage to the sky. And so you, you get this effect. So a couple things, a couple ways, what are, what are ways that you could address this? Well, let me share two different ways that you could address so that you could get this without having the fringing. So let me turn off, uh, let me just zero out all of your hue adjustments here. Uh, and we'll go back to see, this is what, what the image looked like. So I, I know what you're going for. You're going for that, you know, this sort of, um, you know, uh, cotton candy ish, uh, pink and blue sky, which is a nice look. And that's not what you're getting in a straight red and blue swap. So if you were to instead, um, uh, the first, the, there's the first choice, uh, for, for getting those colors is to use a different swap method. And so that's one of the reasons that I have all the swap methods is so that you can, you can pick the different ones. Now, this one would get you that color foliage, but maybe a different color sky. So that could be one option, uh, would be to use a different, um, method of channel mixing. So in this case, we're doing the red and the blue swap, but then we're also doing the, um, uh, shifting the green channel to red. And that's what gets us this, the, this foliage color. So that would be one method for getting those colors. Um, would be to do a different, do it in the channel mixer, basically. Uh, so you could do it in the channel mixer and then create a profile that would be brought over to Lightroom. Um, and that's what these essentially do. Um, and then there's a, but there's a whole bunch of variety. If you're in, um, if you look in, if you take my Photoshop actions, there are, um, a ton of, oh, I don't have an image open. Um, there's a ton of actions in, in the extras folder that try a whole bunch of varieties that would give you different colors. So that would be one approach. Um, let's look at another approach. Let me just grab the straight up red, blue swap, and let's look at another approach. Another approach for getting the colors that you like would be calibration. So come down into the calibration module and play around with the hue slider here. And what you'll find is that you gotta, you gotta play a little bit more to get you know, see what, see what the options are, but one of these might get you. So you can see if I'm messing with the blues, that's getting me, you know, that kind of a look and I'm not getting the fringing, um, with, uh, it's, I mean, there's a hair, but it's not nearly, it's not nearly as obvious. So playing with calibration might be able to get it to you. So that's the second option. I guess a third would be to, to try to create a mask, um, and instead of using HSL would be to use a range mask and do a color range and then grab, um, this color. And then the problem is, is in an infrared image, it's tend to going to see the whole image. You typically will have to refine this down a great deal to get the color you're looking at. Um, you're still not going to be limited to the foliage. It's, you kind of see it's permeating the image and then you could come down to hue and start to make a shift here. Now, now see, you're still, this is going to get you more of that fringing effect. 
Um, so you got to be super careful. You can do the fine adjustment, do just a little bit of an adjustment. So this is trickier. Um, the hue, the hue is going to act more like HSL. You're going to get a little bit of fringing. Uh, but if you stick with, um, the, uh, either a different method of channel mixing or, uh, calibration, you can get a whole variety of different colors, um, that, that would, would give you things to look at. Um, so look at those for an option, but aside from that, very nice image. Um, I might, I guess my only little, this is a total nitpick on my part. I might like bring the highlights down instead of up, just take a little edge off. Uh, but aside from that, um, and you know, maybe darken the grass a little bit. Um, I like to play with water, so I might do a mask on the water and maybe add some clarity there. Uh, but you've got this lovely, you know, texture in this building. Um, and so I would, I would really, you know, ramp up the, come down into the, uh, curve and maybe kick up the contrast a little bit, or you could mask, do a mask and isolate that to the building. Um, but the building this building has such interesting character that if you were to bring up, well, you've already got it. You've got a ton of clarity here at <laughs> 75. Um, may I might like use a lot of clarity, but mask it to the building so that you're getting the clarity in the building, but you're not getting it in uh, the foliage. So that would be probably one of the changes that I would make, but definitely would, would need to spend more time on it, but a lovely composition. Um, thank you, Keith, so much for sharing this image. Um, I really appreciate it. Okay, uh, let's see what's next. So we'll cut back to this. Sign up for the giveaway if you have not done so at this point. Uh, we are probably 20 minutes, less than 20 minutes from uh, running the giveaway. So let's see what, what comments have come up here. Uh, uh, is it possible to do different channel swaps in different masks in Lightroom? Um, no, no, the, um, the, uh, profile that happens here and the profile browser is, is global. It's limited to global. Um, it's not available in masks. Um, I don't know that it would be, I don't know that it will be, it would be nice for, for our work, of course. Um, but if you go into masks, if I, if I just go into, uh, well, let me, hang on, let me, let me switch back. Let me switch back to that image so you can see what we're, what I'm talking about here. Um, so, because I'm, I want to look at the masks here on the right. So if you remember when, when we first started masks had like tone and temp, they, I don't even think they had hue in the beginning. Um, they certainly didn't have curve cause that just came in a few months ago. Um, and I don't know, they might've had effects. But like detail, grain, a lot of this stuff didn't didn't exist when masks were first available. And thankfully, Adobe has kind of struck gold uh, with the masking tool, and it is it is breathed new life into Lightroom and Lightroom Classic. Um, and so my hope is that it will continue. Um, that there will be more continued loving coming to uh, Lightroom through, uh, not only through the, the basic capabilities, the global capabilities, but, but through masking, because this is where it's at. This is where all the cool stuff lives. So even if we don't get um, profiles here, it would be great to get more tools in here to manipulate color. Because right now, we're kind of limited in, in the masking we have. We have color, you can do a color temperature shift, which is very powerful. Uh, the tint, uh, it's, it's, I'm glad it's here, but it's a, it's a big hammer. It's a sledgehammer on an image. Um, and you gotta be really careful with it. And then saturation. I mean, so we have no, there's no vibrance here. There's no HSL here. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that's missing. That would be really great if it was here. And if we had some of those things, maybe we wouldn't need like a full on profile in masks. So, uh, maybe, maybe for the future. Uh, let's see. Um, uh, giveaway. How do I join? You have not missed the giveaway. So basically here are the details. So go to, let me, let me, I mean, point, I got to point to the right way. Go to that address, <laughs> um, uh, 590.red slash giveaway, enter your email and your name so I can 
If you're the lucky winner, I can send you a prize. Enter the code 99 so that I know that you watched today. Only enter once, please. Um, and uh, in just um, 15 minutes or less, we'll do the giveaway. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of content that I have here that I'm never going to get through today. So clearly, I need to be having these uh, more frequently. My, my social media advisor advised that I do live streams weekly. Uh, I don't know if that's going to happen because I don't know what I would shoot then. Uh, but I'm, I think I'm going to have to pick up the pace and get more of these because you all have really great questions and uh, the images are fantastic. So let's move on and take a look at another image. We'll sneak some more in here uh, before. Uh, let's see here. Channel swaps can be masked in dark table. Oh, that's kind of interesting. Thanks for sharing that. Um, power outage. Oh, yikes. Um, well, Thankfully, this is being recorded, and you'll be able to pick up whatever you've missed. Um, so definitely, uh, you can watch later. All right. So let's see here. The next thing we have is uh, from Mark. So let me find the image from Mark. And we can share that and talk about it. Let's see here. Oh, yes. Yes. So we've got a couple here. Uh, let me just let me just share these because these don't need a lot of help from me. Um, so here is uh, the first image uh, from Mark, um, and you know I'm I'm curious. So let's just I'm going to go into the develop module. See this this might be a um, these are both JPEGs. Okay, so I'm not gonna I can't gleam any secrets from your from your images. Um, so we'll just we'll just take a look at them and enjoy them. Um, so it looks like a little bit of a long exposure based on some water blur here and the cloud blur. So that's really nice because then that draws attention to the static objects in the image, uh, the lighthouse and the rocks and the and the water. Um, and I love um, <clears throat> the 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 tonal range in the image and how y your eyes drawn to the lighthouse and drawn to this foreground. Uh, but you've got all this great negative space up the top. So uh, lovely image. Uh, that's very nice. So Mark, thank you for sharing that image. And then one more we'll take a look at. Um, I'm going to guess that this is a composite. Um, so we've got, mainly because I can't normally see the moon through clouds, um, but I love the I love the moodiness of this. Um, so the the very dark rocks in the foreground, you know, there's there might be a, an impulse to try to, bring up the shadows there, but I love how they're, 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 they're sort of kept dark, uh, and it creates a sort of foreboding look. Um, so, uh, very nice, very nice, um, uh, use of, uh, you know, the, um, the sky, um, this kind of like exposed for the sky, um, and then keeping this stuff dark and, and brooding. Uh, I very much like it. So very nice work. Very nice work. Thank you, Mark, for sharing these images with us. Uh, let's see here. All right. So the next up is, let me do this. So while y'all are heading to 590.red slash giveaway and entering your info to, to win the book, um, and entering code 99, uh, let's hit up some questions. So the first question is from Loretta in black and white printing. Do you let the printer take control of the colors or do you use an ICC profile? Um, and so let's, let's take a look at that. Um, so you can see what I'm, what I'm looking at when I'm doing this in Lightroom. So let me find an image here that we can look at. Oh, I could, I suppose I could just do it. We'll just, we'll just do it with Mark's image. We'll just take, we'll take Mark's image. We'll take that first one. Um, and then, let me pull up the develop module. So one of the things that, that you want to do when you're printing um, is you'll want to do a soft proof. So you can either hit the S key to turn that on, or if you hit the T key, you could pull up the toolbar here and click on soft proofing. Um, and what this does is this helps you to validate that the image you're seeing on screen is going to print within the appropriate range of your printer. So whether it's a, a, a monochrome image or whether it's a color image, you're going to want to be able to see are my darks 
or are my highlights blowing out uh, what the printer will be able to do and thus produce a bad print. So what you'll typically want to do is create, I'll typically create a proof copy. Um, and then from the profile, I will select my printer's um, ICC profile. So you can see I've got, I've got a Canon Pro 100 and I've, I use luster paper. So I've got a couple profiles here I can pick from. These are the, your screen profiles, RGB, Display P3, Adobe RGB. But for printing, you're going to want to use an ICC profile and you're going to want to use one that comes from your printer um, so that you can um, make sure that what you're, what you're sending it is within its capabilities. If I go into other here, you can see, oh, oh man, I have not been sharing. I've been sharing the wrong screen. Oh, sorry. Okay. Let me back up. Sorry about that. And here we go. Okay. All right. So I'll just do a quick, quick rewind on this. So it's soft proofing down here in the toolbar. T will bring you up the toolbar. Uh, saw S shortcut key or clicking soft proofing will bring this up. And then if you create, you can create a proof which is like a virtual copy for printing. Um, but it's this profile here that you want to look at. So you've got RGB, uh, uh, display P3, and then these are your screen profiles. And then these are my printer profiles. If I click other, then you can see a whole list of printer profiles. These are for my printer. You could dis you could include any that you've used, but it's really important that, um, you, you do that for anything that you're printing. So I, whenever I'm printing, any, anything serious, um, I will always select um, to create a proof copy. So create a virtual copy that is specific for printing. And the reason is, is that sometimes I will need to make tweaks to the image that only apply to the printed version. So let's say there's a color that's outside the range of my printer. That happens a lot in infrared. I pick some crazy colors and sometimes they're, they're not printers are like, what? Nobody uses this color. And I'm like, well, I use this color. Um, uh, but okay, well, it's not going to print. So you've got to like bring that in, um, especially, um, dark, like shadows of the image that are highly saturated. Those are colors that, um, tend to be like printers and JPEG and stuff are like, nah, nobody sees that. Uh, we're not going to have that. And you're like, no, but in infrared, there's a lot of that. So sometimes you got to like watch your, your color saturation in the, in the darks. Um, or maybe you've got to watch your highlights or your shadows, whatever changes you've got to make, I want to create a proof copy so that I can make those changes in just that copy. And then, um, and then, uh, save that separately. And then when I print then I'm printing a copy, I've got a, I've got a couple of videos on printing one on color printing and one on monochrome printing. So check those out. Um, and those will help you to, um, uh, figure out, um, the, uh, make sure that you're, uh, not wasting a lot of paper, uh, by printing things repeatedly. So definitely use ICC pro profiles. Thank you, Loretta for, um, uh, for the question. Um, next question, um, is from Terry. I think Terry here today. Um, a camera converted to full spectrum can make normal photos with what filter the same camera to make IR doesn't need to, uh, stop UV. Uh, da, 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 da. okay. And, and, and what's the impact on shutter speeds? So, um, let's see here. Let's switch over to, um, this. So, um, so the, the, if you have a full spectrum camera and you want to take normal, normal, um, visible light images, then you're going to need one of two kinds of filter. You're going to need either a hot mirror filter, which is designed to block infrared light specifically. Um, or you're going to need a filter called an, a UV IR filter, which is basically kind of the same thing, but also blocks UV light. Now that's not, if you have that and if you get one of those, that's fine. But in general, UV light is not quite the problem in digital sensors as it was in film. Uh, so not, so not a big deal. If you, if you just have a hot mirror filter, totally fine. Um, you'll, you'll have everything you need. Um, but basically either will do the trick, a hot mirror filter or, um, a UV IR filter, or sometimes called a UV IR cut filter, which will basically, if you, if you had like a, a if you, you viewed a curve, it would show a hundred percent near hundred percent transmission on the visible light. And then it would slope down at the ends, uh, to block off infrared and block off ultraviolet. 
So hot mirror or UV IR cut filter will be the ones you need. Thanks for submitting that, Terry. Um, let's see here. How are we doing on time? Oh, getting near the top of the hour. Uh, let's see. Let me, I'm going to look at one more image. We'll, we'll, we'll get one more in. Um, so we've got an image from Lucy. So let me find that image. And we'll take a look at one more image, and then we'll have our drawing. And then we'll, I'll schedule another, another session very soon so we can cover more of your submissions. Okay, so this is a TIFF image uh, that was sent. Uh, let's see here. All right, so a TIFF image sent from Lucy. So um, looks like uh, you, we've got a, a good white balance um, and no color swap, which is totally fine um, in this kind of an image. So I love, I'll tell you what I like about this image. I love the lines. Um, you've got these, uh, you know, these angled lines going this way uh, from these slats, and then you've got the top line going the other way. Um, those are, that's really strong. Uh, I really like that. Um, the, the, you're see, I'm seeing a little bit of color separation between, uh, maybe these flowers, uh, and the, the leaves, but not much there, not much going on. Uh, so lovely, lovely lines in this image, lovely composition. Um, maybe my only, <coughs> my only observation would be to maybe, um, darken the bottom, like those flowers in the bottom by like maybe a third of a stop just to, uh, because it's so. Uh, catches the eye. And I think darkening that slightly would bring uh, the view up to um, up to uh, the, the lines, which I think is the more interesting sort of subject in this image. Uh, but lovely composition. Uh, thank you so much for sharing. All right. So let us uh, let us have our drawing. All right. And I've got Ah, oh, boy, so much stuff uh, coming up here. Christian, Rowan, Martin, Steve, Greg, John, Keith, uh, Anshul, um, Kathleen. Oh, my goodness, so much stuff. So I'm sorry we couldn't get you all today, but like I said, I will we'll start doing these a little more frequently so we can, we can cover everybody's submissions. Um, when I, at the beginning of the week, I'm like, oh, I've got, we got plenty, plenty of stuff. We, I'll get it all done. I'm totally going to get it all done. And then you all started sending all your stuff in. So, which is great, which is great. Uh, but just, just don't have enough time to cover it. And two hours is about <clears throat> practical limit for my voice and for all of your patience <laughs> as well. Okay. So, all right, let me, um, let me switch my view here. Okay. So now uh, I have to collect your entries and we have to have a drawing. So you're going to have to be patient with me. Uh, talk amongst yourselves um, while, while I pull this together. So let me find, uh, let me see here. Let me, let me get, your, uh, get all your names from our drawing. So let's see here. Here's my form. And 36 submissions. Holy cow. And somebody responded twice. Oh, who is it? Who responded twice? All right, here. Let me export these. Oh, hang on. Just let me. Okay, got that going. Let me export the list of names. Um, all right. Here we go. And all right, so got, let me just, I don't see any, there was, that was not a duplicate. So no duplicates. I don't think we have duplicates. I'm going to, I got, I got a, I've got a de duper. I'm going to run all your names through a de duper and we'll see if there's a, nope, no, no duplicates. You're all safe. All right. Okay. Let's see here. Let me 
get our drawing teed up then. And da -da -da -da. Let me get all the names in. All right. All righty. Copy. We've got a list of names. Let me add more to the list. Holy cow, it's a huge list. So we've got between every and everybody who submitted, well, even if I didn't get to your your submission today, you're still entered in the drawing. So have no fear. Uh, but so between all of the submissions and all of the people entered, we have uh, 50, 54 entries. So you have like a like a two percent chance to win. All right, so let me uh, let me share this so you can see what I'm doing here. I want everybody to be able to, to see uh, the the excitement here. All right. Uh, let's see. Uh, da, 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 da. All right. Let me share my screen so you can see. So so we could we. Oh, wait a minute. There is. Oh, I I found a duplicate. I'm not going to say who it is. I'm not going to call you out. I'm not going to call you out. Somebody who goes by two different names. You know who you are. I'm not going to call you out, though. I, I caught it. Caught it ahead of time. All right. Oh, I see another one. Okay. Y'all are making me have to double check my list here to make sure. I th You know what it is? I think it's people who, who, who already... Um, I, I pre-entered people um, uh, for... I pre-entered people uh, who, who submitted stuff. Um, and so that's where I'm seeing duplicates from. Let me, <clears throat> let me quickly find uh, a way to alphabetize this list. And then um, once I have alphabetized the list, then it will be much easier for me to identify any duplicates. Okay. All right. Okay. Oh man, there's another one. Your, your your odds. The more I eliminate the duplicates, your odds are improving. So it's it's really in everyone's best interest here to for me to do this. Oh, there's another one. Okay, working down the list. All right. Okay. Okay. Let me take one more pass down the list. I think I've got everybody. All right. Here we go. And let me enter my names in now, and then I can share my screen so you all can see what I'm looking at. Now we 48. So your, your odds have improved by a few percentage points. <laughs> no, there's no blame here. As, as I said in the forum, uh, people who, who entered twice will be diffracted. Um, but no, no worries, no worries. Um, all righty, let me share my screen here so you can see what I'm doing. So we have the wheel up. Uh, let's see here. All righty, this is, this is our, our prize wheel. So we've got everybody's name here on the list and it's spinning and we've got a nice palette of, you know, sort of, uh, uh, 550 to 590 ish colors of our, our yellows and our oranges and our reds. Um, and then we've got everybody's name and then, um, I'm going to, I'll click the wheel and then we'll, we'll all share together to see who wins. So to see, to see who comes up, who's our winner for today. All righty, here we go. So let me click the wheel and we'll start spinning and away it goes. And it's slowing down, slowing down. And it is Tony, Tony Hayward. Congratulations, Tony. You are the winner today for a copy of my book. Color does not exist. So please, if you have not checked out the book, please do so. Uh, this is a sort of a labor of love. Everything I've learned about infrared photography in 320 pages. Um, and uh, would love to for you to be able to share in this and enjoy it. So, uh, Tony, 
We'll be getting one for free. Um, but if you're interested uh, in learning more about infrared, then go to infraredbook.com and read all about it. Um, I just added a ton of reviews. Thanks to everybody who's written a review of the book. Uh, it's been amazing. The feedback has been phenomenal. I really love it. Um, so uh, thank you, everybody, for stopping by. Um, uh, thanks for your patience. If I did not get to you to your, your question or your image, we will do this more frequently um, so that I can make sure I cover uh, everybody's image. So I'll schedule the next session in the next day or two, um, and we'll get that on the calendar. But thank you so much. Um, have a great day, everybody. Go out and shoot. Bye.